um hello hello everyone i would like you i would like to welcome you all to the last session of the day in the previous session we talked about the relationship between disability and culture and how they are closely intertwined and how our understanding of culture as a whole aids and deepens our understanding of disability and how our understanding of disability enhances our understanding of culture today we will in this session we shall turn away from culture to move on to law and talk about disability and law and how they speak to each other and interact with each other we have with us professor amita dhanda from nasal hyderabad welcome professor dhanda but before i hand over the mic to her it is my immense pleasure to call upon dr saprishi mandal from jindal university to moderate the session dr mandal is assistant professor and assistant director at center for human rights studies at the jindal global law school His work centers around the intersections and linkages between disability and law, sexual violence, as well as the sociology of law. And I will now pass on the mic to you, sir, and ask you to start the session. Thank you, Stuti. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I mean, Professor Dhanda does not need an introduction to this crowd. uh she is uh, currently professor emerita at nalsar university of law hyderabad where she has taught for uh, more than 20 years uh, prior to that she has taught at the indian law institute she has been part of numerous law reform committees uh, commissions of inquiry uh, set up by the supreme court of india and uh, for many of us who have an interest in disability law and mental health law her writings are are uh, starting points uh, they they also sort of give us our frame of reference uh, professor dhanda is the author of legal order and mental disorder and a number of edited collections on issues ranging from family law to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, to pedagogy knowledge, legal knowledge and so on and so forth uh, this evening she'll be speaking on why law and disability studies speak to Uh, 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 need to speak with each other, uh, Professor. So, so the uh, format is as follows: uh, Professor Thanda would speak for about an hour, and uh, after that we will take questions. So, I'll ask you to post your question in the in the chat, and uh, we'll 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 take those questions at the end of the lecture. Over to you, Professor Thanda. Thank you so much, Saptushi. and uh, thank you for at least uh, making the introduction not too long <laughs> okay so um what i'm going to do with you this evening is uh, primarily to look at the way in which law and disability studies not just interact but ought to interact with each other so it's more on on the basis of what each has to gain from the other that is the thrust of my uh, presentation this evening i don't think i'll speak for an hour but i can't say once one starts off and one, one is going the other way around so but whichever way will it's it's like i speak and then we sort of discuss so uh, for as long as so the way in which i'm going to be the scheme of my presentation is like i'll be firstly looking at how law is commonly construed and constructed because in an in an interdisciplinary and a multi sectoral audience i think it's important somewhere to speak about law as it's ordinarily understood there are other ways of looking at law which are not necessarily the dominant way of looking at it but because the dominant way seems to dictate discourse in a major way i'm going to concentrate more there then i want to kind of proceed from there to look at the central components of disability studies i think amongst the things and shilpa anand has been in her uh, discussion group been raising this issue of uh, how different people you know how they operationalize disability studies why do you need to have it and the very fact that she's wanting to have that discussion is demonstrative of the fact that there's no one definition of disability studies so i am just going to be uh, foregrounding the one i have the one or at least the components that i find are very critical for me especially in the context of the argument that i'm setting up this evening then i proceed from there to look at what, why law needs to engage with disability studies 
how this engagement could deepen democracy. And the last slide, which I have there about disability studies has relevance for all, is the reverse side where I'm sort of somewhere starting to see what disability studies can be taking from law, because my presentation is about why they should be engaging with each other. So I thought it was only uh, relevant to sort of look at it from both sides. So when I begin with this dominant perception of law, it's like, I suppose it's, it's something that even law people subscribe to quite often, that it's seen as this authoritative articulation of what we are meant to do or not to do. And you know, you'd have very often you go to places and you'll say, you have to do such and such thing because that's the law. The law is supposed to be that non-negotiable kind of articulation. This is, the, this is the benchmark of the kind of behavior that you are supposed to follow. I mean, we're seeing all around us, no? I think the, the fact that uh, this poor young bacha who's been picked up is got to do again with this fact of that, yes, this is what your, you know, the, your consumption of uh, drugs is meant to be. And if you, irrespective of how you perceive the whole issue, if you have gone run foul of the law, then that itself can become a basis for you being picked up. So this authoritative articulation plays out in se several kinds of ways. So even if you have a more critical perspective towards law, you may still find <clears throat> that this authoritative articulation starts to dictate your behavior. And in the other dimension of it is, it is authoritative cause it is authoritarian. That is, it is some, somebody who's in a position of power and who can get, who can exercise that power, who can, uh, you know, what should I say, who can make it stick. That's the kind of, so we very typically say it's the command of the sovereign. So whoever is the head of the person who's holding that office, and it's a largely a top-down venture. Uh, people are recipients of the law, not really participants in its making. You can, I mean, we all are aware of the fact as you know, we all of the time you'd have a draft being circulated, the policy being given out, people being asked to respond, react to it. But what you do with those inputs, they say you give it to us in week and 10 days, but what you do with the inputs, they're really speaking, we don't know. Uh, occasionally, sometimes, at least in civil society ventures, you try to acknowledge the fact that, okay, we got this and that input from so-and-so people, we've altered and changed things in this manner, but that's not the way in which officially things work. If you insist that you have to be giving, you know, your suggestions, recommendations, you will say it should come in three weeks or two weeks, and then whether it goes into the draft or it goes into the waste paper basket, we have no means of knowing. So it's, it's the, it's the, this is the way in which we look at the law and which is why, because uh, very often you'd find that when people are wanting that the way in which they perceive issues or they, or they see things, that's the way that should be dictating uh, social practice or how their particular questions should be addressed. You ask for the making of a law or you seek the amendment of the law. And this is one image of the law, which we, we I think, uh, let me say it in two ways. One is that whether we like it or not, this becomes the, the overarching or overbearing kind of way in which law operates in society. And that's where in say, if you, if you believe that as a conscientious objector or as somebody who doesn't really agree with what the law is about, you protest, you still have, whether that protest will be taken seriously or not is one dimension of it. The other is you could still be prosecuted for having breached this uh, authoritative articulation of the law. And uh, in, in, its, in the way in which at least especially it operates in our country, uh, we don't really give any kind of uh, sajidari or partnership to people in this make in this lawmaking process, and if there is any kind of uh, partnership, it's much more. I mean, our general experience is it's much more a notional, nominal, symbolic exercise. It's not something that we really are doing business on. Okay, 
Now, uh, how do I view disability studies? I felt it was important for me to put out both these constructs because if I'm asking them to speak with each other, then it's like, which is the part of law which seems to be ruling over us? And how is I perceive disability studies? I mean, I, I've already said that there's no one construction. And I think in through the lectures that you've heard other people make different kinds of uh, constructions or conceptions of disability studies have been shared with you. Well, I see it very much as a venture which is aimed at democratization of knowledge. The reason why I say that is because though I think to a large extent feminism did it, but I, disability studies took it deeper, that it's knowledge produced both through study and through experience. In fact, the entire making of all of us who followed the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UN Convention, amongst the things which was very, very noticeable in the making of the convention was the kind of privilege which was accorded to the experience of disability or the knowledge acquired through experience. And the entire set of proceedings, one of the things which came in very, very majorly was where people who had uh, who had their own understanding of both disability and their study of disability coming in from their lived experience were turning around and telling people, you cannot let your perception of the condition dictate how we are to look at the entire phenomena of disability. So, uh, and I think that then when it came, came into the academic discipline too, you had a large number of other methodologies which started to work out mechanisms by which this experiential knowledge was to be given that full standing stature of understanding and knowledge. The other dimension which I felt was equally important is that participation and voice was seen as critical to the making of this knowledge. You couldn't just, I mean, you know, see there's an entire uh, period at which the whole, understanding of dis disability came in from not people with disabilities, but other people looking at them. So the this dominance of what you would see as the third person voice, or, you know, like where you, you because you were also seeing it as some kind of a, a, a deficit you were fixing, you felt that the person who's supposed to be in this deficit, deficient manner can hardly be the person who knows what it's all about. I think the incoming of both disability rights and disability studies has reversed that process. And you start, I'm not saying every person with disabilities out there coming and saying I'm an expert by experience. What you were saying is that you can't create a whole body of expertise shorn of, divorced from, the people who are in fact experiencing. And you are also starting to say that this experience is not necessarily wow. only limited to people with uh, you know, specified kinds of impairments and stuff. Disability or is a perspective or is a lens that gets you to see, look at people in a more inclusive kind of manner. So uh, the other thing which comes in very strongly with disability studies is that you do not speak of a monolithic world or a singularity of understanding. You start to recognize that there are various ways in which you can be looking at the world. And the very fact, I mean, amongst the things which White came in also from the whole experience was that you can't essentialize. You have to recognize this value of the individual, the individual experience, the individual way of being, and encompass it within the community and within that whole body of knowledge. So the, see this, I'm contrasting this with what I just spoke in terms of the law, that it's not like we do not have critical ways of looking at the law, or you don't have whole schools of thought which talk about law, looking at law in a more, you know, in a more, you can say, in a more multifaceted kind of manner. But the dominant way of looking at law is largely very authoritative, authoritarian, singular. If you bring in any exceptions or provisos, there's a whole range of hoops that you have to go through before that they kind of are given any sort of space. In contrast, what you find in disability studies is that you are by the very nature of the discipline, recognizing the fact of multiplicity, diversity, the fact that there is a possibility of, you know, you need to, this is the range of meaning and, meaning and 
this these layers of meaning is something that you have to admit to and acknowledge so this is the these are the two protagonists of my talk today and how they can be speaking to each other what is it that they could be getting from each other is the thrust of my argument and why am i sort of like see uh i think we've been whether it is the protests of the farmers whether it is the entire for for a long period of time the debates that we've had around the uh nrc and the whole issue of citizenship or it's like where you are saying is that just because you have gone and made uh, a particular legislation or have a set of legislations with a particular perspective should not become uh, you know should not be a final word in the matter but what lawmakers are assess asserting is that both superiority and singularity of understanding so you're basically saying is that see this is the way in which we make law and all the processes of making a law of introducing in parliament having it discussed or not discussed having it passed by the requisite authorities yeah. it, it getting its imprimatur from the president it being notified in the gazette that all has been done so now what has come is law the fact that it is not according with what a lot of what should i say you're not willing to entertain it you so you, you do not think that it, that the people for me between what I had narrated in relation to disability studies and, and the manner in which we understand lawmaking and the power that the law, the authority that the lawmakers and law itself is meant to be. So I would say if we're to look at this interrelation between them, disability studies way of looking at things would object to such objectification. This it's you know like the need to promote experiential understanding and accept diversity. See this very fact of the singularity of meaning. Uh, there is that what, I, what I'm sort of saying is there is disability studies would object to the or put out that there is no singularity of meaning even as people even as a single person or individual may be seeking recognition and identity in the law i have in in a previous lecture quite recently also spoken about the fact of that uh, whether we should be looking at legal capacity even as a as any kind of an empowering gateway because the very fact that legal recognition has to be obtained before i can assert rights and who can obtain that legal uh, recognition or not is again dictated by the same set of people who believe in that whatever they put in the law is that 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 is supreme and if you don't come in there then you keep battling for it and after you come in maybe we would afford you recognition but before that if you are if you don't have legal capacity that seems to be your uh, legal situation and there's a whole body of uh, jurisprudence which has started to come where you are not agreeing or accepting this mediated way of getting legal recognition and you're saying just the fact of your being should be enough for you to be having all of these rights this business of mediating rights through a through a legal mechanism is per se problematic so just by obtaining legal recognition or le uh, recognition the, before the law, uh, the the medium itself is problematic. I think I'm just taking that particular conversation a little further today by saying what lawmakers need to obtain from disability studies. I'm primarily saying is that that participative streak, the fact that you don't know it all, the fact that there is such a lot of diversity and hence any kind of monolithic understanding is per se problematic is something which uh, law makers and law needs to obtain from disability studies because if there is any kind of major cultivation that is happening uh, of the whole notion of diversity of the fact that each individual person is of value in themselves I think it comes in a major way from the whole 
does, I mean, at least one, one body of thought or body of study, which is promoting that kind of understanding is how I see the celebrity studies. Now, the moment you start to do this, uh, what is it that one gains from? If you, if you allow for this very um, monolithic way of looking at the world, you allow it to be questioned, and you allow for this confrontation between two disciplines. The, the difficulty, of course, with law is that it's not just a discipline. It's not just an area of study. It's a large area of application. And a large part of that application happens to as much to disability as it happens to other places. The, uh, my, the point somewhere is that, see, the rule of law is at one very core level is aimed at advancing equality by making everyone subject to the law. Saying everyone is, you know, like you, you have equal opportunity before the law and you're equal before the law. At least all of us who have been working in relation in the, in the field of disability and disability rights know for a fact that for the longest period of time, all that the law tended to do to disability was to exclude, was to say that, okay, uh, whether it's this disability or that disability, you know, you are, you are not somebody we recognize, or if we recognize you, we recognize you partially for some things and not for other things. So it's for this, if, if law is supposed to be advancing the equality project, then it's necessary that, it, that the norm should accord recognition to all. In the way in which uh, legal capacity has been construed, or the manner in which the law disability interaction has happened, even with the uh, Article 12 and the uh, universal legal capacity with support being put out as the new, new paradigm, you still find that uh, you need to get that specific passport or password by which that entry will happen. And even if you were to do it for disability, you may keep somebody else out. I mean, in these days of climate change and the fact of us talking about climate refugees, the entire problem with stateless people, there's a whole range of uh, exclusions which are just waiting to happen. So even if some set of people have come in, there are others who are getting left out. If we were to take this insight from disability studies where you're saying that no, every individual matters. There is no essence of mind or body, the possession of which gets you entry. That, that's, that's exactly the kind of uh, challenge that you are putting out there. And uh, so if you, if you marginalize or exclude, then you are definitely not promoting the equality of everybody, that equality before the law is not happening in fact. So I would somewhere say that disability studies, because it both recognizes and nurtures diversity, it's, a, it's like uh, it's doing, it's rectifying that which is, in my view, one of the major absences or gaps in the way in which the law looks at people. And that's the reason why I feel this business of that every individual matters, every person matters, and just by your being you matter. You don't need some kind of an imprimatur of personhood to be given to you for that, uh, for that value to be accorded to you. So I somewhere feel that if we are really speaking in terms of a rule of law society, we need to somewhere on a very foundational basis question this essentializing seems to be a part of the legal exercise. And diversity needs to be woven in, in a more deep manner. And it's that uh, diversity, uh, once it is I sort of see, feel that if these two disciplines speak with each other, then possibly you get yourself a perspective which is absent from the law. Uh, it's like, the reason I'm sort of saying is absent from the law, it's more like that I first exclude you, then I allow you certain kinds of remedial measures, or I bring in your, you know, uh, what should I say, your inclusion through 
other mechanisms. I, I had kind of like a couple of days ago spoken and uh, at, a, at a book function, which was looking at education and inequality. And I was referring to the work of both Tanmoy Bhattacharya and Anita Ghai, who were questioning the way in which uh, disability rights have been envisaged uh, in the law, wherein the formulation of, uh, you know, uh, to the extent possible, the, as far as possible, as, you know, the best that is possible, that those kinds of formulations that you, you are not saying you get everything, you're saying you get as much as is possible. So I was in fact asked in that uh, particular presentation as to whether these two authors were asking for the concept of reasonable accommodation to be dropped. And at that point, because I think I somewhere, uh, some buyers crossed in my head and I sort of said no, basically because the kind of articulation of reasonable accommodation that I have been promoting is that if even one person stands excluded, the accommodation is not reasonable. Because in my opinion, it's, it is only reasonable if everybody comes in. So, so the kind of, I was trying to reject the whole notion of proportionality and to say that as far as possible, you will try to get people in. But if you look at the way in which reasonable accommodation principles have been formulated, as well as in how they have been interpreted by courts, as well as in policy, you are in fact not saying that in all situations, people with disabilities are to be included. You are in fact somewhere uh, excluding them in, in positions where you feel that the cost of including them is disproportionate. It's, it's a pretty economic logic out there too. So one would then, I mean, I would literally revise the response I gave, though of course at a very different forum, but because it's been troubling me since then, I'm kind of using your platform to revisit that question, to say that yes, reasonable accommodation, though it's a powerful concept and though it's the one place where we are individuating and saying that if, if, if the rule doesn't make provision for you, then we, you will be reasonably accommodated. Now, the very fact that you're saying reasonably accommodated and the entire jurisprudence is that if what is required to be done is not a disproportionate uh, investment that is to be that has to be made to include you, you will be included. But if the investment is disproportionate, then you are going to be excluded. And that's the kind of uh, jurisprudence and that is the kind of legal understanding that I want us to foundationally challenge. And I feel that the discipline of disability studies, which gives value to each individual person, gives values to gives value to diversity as a, as a you know, as a way, as a integral part of the human condition, it would not accept that expression of reasonable accommodation, would not accept that way of looking at individuals. And I'm not just talking in terms of, which is going to be like the next point I'm making as I'm coming to, uh, I basically want to spend more time discussing with you this argument that I'm making. So you, the moment you sort of allow for that to happen, you are, uh, in effect, saying some people can be included and others can be kept out. It is a legitimacy of that kind of proposition that I feel needs to be foundationally challenged. And I think that if one has to be creating justifications and uh, putting out a reasoning for why this is an unjust and unfair of way of operating, then you could be drawn from this. So this is one part of when I'm saying that why they need to speak with each other. I definitely feel that law has a lot more to sort of get from disability studies. If we want to be questioning this very uh, exclusionary way of operating the law, exclusionary way of conceptualizing the law and believing it is legit to keep certain people out. I suppose it's a way in which we have constructed the human, wherein you're, you're possessing of certain kinds of faculties, you're being a certain kind of mind and body, was seen as uh, unquestionable uh, attributes that needed people need to be possessing for inclusion. The entire constructive unsoundness of mind and law has been 
And it's like, it's, uh, at least my study has demonstrated that the, the uh, requirement of soundness and unsoundness of mind is almost mechanically incorporated in the law. You don't even really worry about whether you need to have that disqualification or not, you just put it in. Similarly, when you are sort of asking for a sound mind, you really don't have a very clear idea of why are you asking for it, but you ask for it because it's taken for granted that people who don't possess soundness of mind, of course, which is a higher standard, or people who are of unsound mind need to be kept out. I am saying is this exclusion which we have hardwired into legal understanding. And the reason why there is a connection between unsoundness of mind and all other kinds of exclusion is that what you also find is that when the other grounds of exclusion are in some way um, shown to be illegitimate, people fall back on unsoundness of mind. What has now happened is this, that I suppose disability studies or disability rights has moved far enough where it's no longer so easily politically correct to say that you can be excluded by reason of disability. And hence you have other kinds of, whether it's the whole nationalist project, whether it is the project of, you know, like, okay, if you do not belong to, or if your country itself has vanished, then too bad. You know, it's, it's in those kinds of enterprises. And not just in relation to nation and state, but even in relation to workers and what kind of work you recognize or you don't recognize. What I'm trying to put forth to you that there is a big continuum of a large number of people who for different kinds of criteria get excluded from getting their full due as humans. And because that happens through the medium of the law, it's important to both interrogate the law as well as to see where is it there are possibilities of uh, mm, rectifying this evident injustice in the legal perspective. And that's why I'm saying we need to be nurturing diversity and if you want to deepen democracy and deepen participation. So this engagement of law with disability studies is important. And in this last slide, I want to speak the other way and sort of say that, all right, um, why is it that I feel disability studies is not just about persons with impairments? Even as I have on a very constant basis spoken of, I think that was a starting point. But I do think that just as feminism started with its first concern with women and then proceeded further to a great extent to be a theory about oppression and exclusion, uh, not just of women, but as such of oppression and exclusion. And especially when a feminist thought uh, kind of got, got in acquainted with the whole notion of intersectionality, you started to realize that, okay, within women, uh, and within the way in which you are being a woman and the sort of oppression you're experiencing, it's not the same for all women. So if inclusion has to happen, you can't talk of some one, one size fits all feminism. You, your, your movement from feminism to feminisms primarily came from there. I'm also saying is that if you are starting to see the sort of ways in which uh, you can say social barriers are imposed whether or not you possess a physical, mental, sensory impairment. Is, is somewhere an exclusion which is practiced? Which is an exclusion which is being practiced. And I think that exclusion as much a subject of disability studies. And especially if disability studies is going to provide that kind of moral reasoning for the sort of exclusions that are practiced within the law, then I do think that it is important that disability studies is not just about persons with impairments. Because its precepts have relevance for society at large. It provides a way, and it definitely has a, as a space of operation, which is way larger. And it, it, you know, it's like this, it has a way of questioning this routine othering of the other, which we see all around us. I am of the view that uh, 
थोड़ा पालक पालक रोटी बना देना बाकी पालक का सब्जी प्याज I'm sorry, somebody has their microphone on, and we're getting the dinner cooked. Boon ke karna hai, aur ya aur palak ki sabzi. Palak aur pyaaz, huh? Doctor Sunanda, please mute yourself. <laughs> okay, so we've got the dinner done. Palak and pyaaz both have come, so it's good. Uh, so the thing somewhere is this that if you start to see like i said no with feminism we started out with looking at just women as the subjects of or the people from whom you your entire theorizing was happening and then you found that the insight of feminism extended to way beyond at the same time i'm not in any which way denying that you know this engagement with people with impairments or the kind of exclusions that they are experiencing are not to be like a uh, subject of study uh, in disability studies i'm only saying is this that if exclusion and uh, disqualifications which come through the law primarily because of the fact that you don't see all individuals or all humans as worthy of inclusion then this discipline which is concerned with including all needs to be looking at issues of procedures of exclusion which are larger than just people with impairments and and, and there's also the the other thing which i feel is important is that uh, there is a need to acknowledge both in the making of law as well as in our interaction with each other in a society life experiences which are not our own we have for long a uh, kind of made it that people holding or let's say the, the people who have the power to both uh, you know the, the epistemic power the power of creating meaning has been an exclusive exercise so if disability studies were to start to look at how law practices that exclusion of ousting out whole range of meanings and sees that a matter of sub, a subject of its uh, like as a part of its domain i think uh, it it would sort of it, it's a way of looking which has a wider relevance and that wider relevance i think needs to be owned and practiced thank you so much thank you professor dhanda for that wide ranging talk uh, i have taken a lot of notes that i i, I would sort of need a lot of time to process and uh, sort of make sense of uh, to the you, boy, was i talking of... nonsense uh, saprishi no 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 i was taking <laughs> i was so engrossed in taking notes that i said i'll i'll take some i, I need some time to make sense of everything and sort of uh, it was yeah uh, uh, to the participants uh, the will 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 start taking questions uh, you could either type your question in uh, the chat box or you could use the raise hand function and uh, we'll will hear from you um, but if i if i can start the the discussion uh, by talking about some of the things that came to my mind as i was listening to professor dhanda so professor dhanda begins by uh talking about this fundamental contradiction that seems to exist between law and disability studies on the one hand law is associated with uh, an authoritative system of meanings it tends to control meanings it tends to establish fixed meanings of things and it also operates in an authoritarian manner so uh, uh it 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 also enforces those singular meanings and singular world views uh, uh uh on the others uh disability studies on the other hand uh takes the diversity of experiences or diversity of meanings as its starting point and it also emphasizes on participation right so things that we do not find in uh in in law now i was thinking that 
uh, these two aspects, diversity of experiences or meanings and, and participation, uh, anyone with a belief in popular sovereignty would also stand by these ideals. Uh, anyone who cares about democracy would stand by these ideals. Then what does disability studies brings? Is there anything particular that disability studies brings to, to this understanding? Because we could talk about these values even without talking about disabled people's experiences or, or disability studies as a discipline. So, so then my question would be, how do we, and, and this relates to uh, uh, the, the, the question that Shilpa Anand has been raising for some time. How do we, how do we justify disability studies as a legitimate discipline? So, so how, how do we, how, so in, in answering this question, we could have an answer to Shilpa's question as well. Uh, uh, so maybe, so I, I'd love to start with that question and, and uh, would love to hear Professor Dhanda's thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's a very valid question, uh, Satvishi. And it's a question that um, in some way or the other, every time you, even when you speak about intersectionality, it comes in as what's so unique about disability. It is not like intersectionality is after all experienced, like I have, I've also sort of referred to feminism throughout. So then why am I not saying that feminism is something that should be engaging with the law? Uh, why is it that I'm asking for disability studies to come to the forefront? Like see, one of the reasons why I'm sort of speaking in terms of that, if you look at the, even within the realm or the world of impairments, just stay there, not talk about the larger questions that I'm speaking about and just stay there. One of the things which you find is this, that this is one body of knowledge which constantly requires, even at its first essential, it's like you just stay with, I mean, if you look at uh, Jagdish Chandar's work and the sort of point he makes in relation to the activism which came with the blind. But you can't sort of speak in terms of all people with blindness at the same place. It's, it's like within that whole business of impairments, there's a, there's a range of difference. I mean, even if you were to look at some of, the, some of the difficulties they've had between low vision and blindness, and the fact that both of them got reservation in your 95 statute, you needed to sub, in some manner, you know, comprehend that, okay, um, if I have to be in community with this entire, entire set of people, and I start further go and divide that up, it doesn't help anybody. But for you to comprehend that the oppression and exclusion that has been experienced by the person with low vision, maybe in some manner not very dramatically different from what you are coming up here. The process of having to get into the shoes of the other, is much more present in disability than you'd find, say, in, in other areas. For me, that's a very, very integral part of why disability studies can be doing this exercise more effectively. You pick up, you know, the whole realm of physical impairments. I mean, I, I had, I remember a couple of years ago, there was this conference that we were having in the Law Institute, and here's a one person who came there who had a really, really, like, if you would say, a very slight limp. It, it is like in, in the face of a whole range of people who have, and yet the, the, he came in from a remote part of the country where evidently his limp was targeted in a manner which was as acute as somebody with, in, in the physical impairment state would be, but the, in, your, in your higher percentages. And as all other people were listening to him, they felt a certain, uh, a certain connection and a consequent of understanding that, okay, you know, uh, because you are not the prototype, that you have departed from that prototype, the treatment in terms of discrimination was no different for this individual, not in terms of, you know, the things he could do and not do. I'm not onto that. And large part of my argument here is coming in terms of creating a, uh, let's say, a society of humans 
where you accept people just as they are. And this is something that when any kind of uh, disability um, advocacy has to be launched, any, uh, any conversation and disability rights has to be done, this business of self and other, this business of hierarchy and privilege has to be challenged and questioned by anybody who has to lead that process within the disability sector, I'm not even saying outside. And that learning which you acquire over a period of time gives you a body of knowledge, which is not there in other uh, encounters. And yet in some ways, it's the human body and you know, like the human body, if it's mind and body are seen as one, uh, which is the, uh, it's that embodiment, which kinds of has a commonality. If you make the fact of that embodiment itself, a route through which you are going to be uh, starting this conversation of humanness, I think there's way more scope and there's way more writing which allows for that to happen in disability studies. That would be like largely my answer. One can keep building on it, but core, I have given you what I have said. So. Yeah, it, it raises further questions in my mind, which I'll put forth to you in some time. But of, maybe I'm not saying that uh, questions won't be there. Yeah. I'm only sort of saying this, that if one has to differentiate between right. other kinds of exclusions, or even when you talk in terms of popular democracy, because see, one of the things which popular democracy doesn't really address is the, is the fact of the very real mind and body diversity which exists within humans. And a real engagement with it, not an academic engagement with it, not an intellectual engagement with it, but an experiential engagement with it. That doesn't come in the same way elsewhere. See, I can in principle agree to something. And within that same populist uh, reasoning, we have worked out, you know, we've kind of uh, hardwired exclusions, or we have said the, the feasibility of inclusion is only till here. And we've not found it problematic. I'm saying is this that uh, the entire venture of disability advocacy and rights couldn't proceed further. I'm saying it also uh, partly subtleship because of my experience at the CRPD negotiations. And you found, you know, that whilst these in organizations started as very independent entities, how progressively they had to collapse those differences and start to, you can say it was at a certain point of time, you know, it happened. Uh, but the very fact that you could do it, not that you did, you know, you should do it, but you could do it. And how you did it became a part of the, the knowledge which came in within the discipline. That's, that's my point. I think it's an additional point I've made. Thank you. Uh, I can see a couple of hands up. Uh, Samir Chaturvedi, would you unmute and ask your question, please? Hi, Professor Dhanda. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let me formulate my question this way. Like, uh, in this year only, government of India has come up with new list of identification of jobs for persons with disabilities. And they have categorized it uh, in so many layers, like OL, uh, uh, one hand affected, then BLA, then CP. I am person with cerebral palsy. Uh, I am person with cerebral palsy. And I am aspiring for becoming an academician. But what is happening? The jobs which are coming uh, job advertisement in Uttar Pradesh or other state or uh, I am not talking about central universities because uh, I haven't seen many openings for persons with disabilities there, persons with orthopedic disabilities. But what I can tell you from my own experience about Uttar Pradesh 
like what they did they reserve feed for one one arm affected both arms affected partial partial blindness partial deaf right and then my chance my like i am not saying that these sets a these set of people are incapable or something i'm just saying my chance of applying for that job they have snatched it so and i am thinking of uh, i am thinking of filing a case in a high court but there is a there is also a catch you don't have many legal expert working uh, in the domain of disability rights so yeah that is my question hope i uh some I mean, question i thought it was a you. comment basically yeah uh, i wanted to ask how the way government formulates a whole disability criteria it is rather than solving anything they are further furthering uh uh they are ableist bias i i yes. can uh, say so because they are thinking from their med medical vantage point that a person with cerebral palsy will not be able to do a proper job of it so no that, i agree that, i mean like i'm furthering what you have argued i'm sorry i didn't get the yeah. last sentence like i am further and the part of your lecture is for disability studies lens to take prominence but what what i can see like even in a policy framework they are complicating issues rather than solving huh. issues but some you see what i am saying is basically that the complications are coming from the law yeah it is not coming in so much from the disability sector or the you know the, it's like when you are offered it's like between if you do a divide and rule kind of thing and if you the very the very phenomena of benchmark uh, disabilities the fact that though you brought in the discrimination point you didn't really make it in any which way very powerful all of that perception is coming in more from ki okay uh, because we have limited resources this is how we're going to distribute them this is the manner in which the affirmative action program is going to run it's a legal perspective which is all of the time othering that's the thrust of what i was saying see i was not making i was not so much talking in terms of uh, uh, and i didn't speak about the disability law i was speaking about law generally like law generally when it comes into disability it does exactly what it is doing generally it's worked out a system of inclusion and exclusion who will come in and who will stay out and it's not gone beyond that your even your notions of you know discrimination are uh, like in the uh, 95 act we did not even have the provision of discrimination so you were only speaking in terms of people for whom your social economic rights will run and not run and because you stayed with those four disabilities you didn't have a much too complicated adventure now you expanded the number of impairments but you're bringing in all kinds of other conditionalities to ensure that really speaking everybody is just fighting battles in courts here and there the kind of uh, supposed support that you're meant to get from the law is not happening and that's where i mean i concentrated more on saying this is a way of thinking if you look at the 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 statute which came in from the the widely consulted statute the the bill which we had created the committee had created and the legislation which got passed by the by the state and you just compare the two you would see that if you have a perspective of inclusion how you proceed and if you don't have one how you proceed i do think it's see for me the the bill has become like an academic document just to see if your imagination is an imagination of inclusion then partly this is again like feeding into your query subtlety you know when your imagination is an imagination of inclusion you proceed in one kind of way but if you are only 
bothered about the fact of ki, okay, hamar pas, this is the resources that we have and this is how we're going to apportion them. In the process, if the entire set of, you know, there's some people who are brought in and other people who are thrown out, too bad. I am sort of saying is, if you look at conceptually what the, the two disciplines are about, you would start to see ki, what, what disability studies, disability studies has to give to law. And that has not informed the legislation we've made or the policy that we are bringing out. But I thought, you know, one of the things which, which workshops and idea forums are meant to do is to open up that imagination and not get, uh, because the kind of imagination the government is showing is an imagination of how can we sort of like get these people to just quarrel with each other, so to say. There's a second hand up from Sharmishtha. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your last name. Could you uh, unmute and ask a question, please? Yeah, absolutely, Sharmishtha. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I can't tell you how comforting the whole talk was um, uh, because I don't know whether I can you know, sort of share my experiences on ground with regard to reasonable accommodation and how we use it in our letters uh, to get certain simplistic things done in, a, in, in an institute where I work, central government. And how how do they twist how do they twist them and and also how how does it go to people who are who are persons with disability and who are sort of responsible who are, who are sort sort of given this responsibility to further take care of the um uh, in the equal op opportunities and how do they respond to reasonable accommodation it is absolutely um I mean it, first of all it's it's comforting to see that people like you on top who really um, who designed uh, this law sort of know what's happening on ground and um, uh, but uh, and but on the other hand uh, I wanted to uh, just take some clues back that how do we really work out ways to uh, fight with this mindset and also I love the sentence that you used uh, the procedure of exclusion and reasonable reasonable accommodation unfortunately has become a um, a procedure uh, of exclusion because when we when when we get answers negative negative replies from people uh, from whom we have um, um, the largest hopes um, like why do you need such a thing uh, I am a blind person myself why do you need why why can't you climb up on the second uh, second uh, second uh, second floor for example such such kind of uh, things coming from the same disability and when you tell them I mean you, you just now said that there's a difference between how um, um, how 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 blindness could be how, how different sorts of blindness uh, could be different for, for for different people so just just trying to share my experience and uh, i'm sort of i don't even know whether this is appropriate to say this because here uh, on a public platform but i'm so tempted to say this although i'll stop here and um, maybe expect something uh, to take back so that um, we all could use it in an efficient way. And all, um, uh, and ma'am, since you're saying that it is coming from the legal, uh, I mean, it, it, the law is, or jurisprudence pr prudence interprets it such that it is uh, completely, uh, I mean, it is inherently uh, difficult for, um, uh, for execution. Uh, I, I don't know whether I should take it with the despair or uh, maybe you can you you can uh, maybe uh, make it a little hopeful um, giving me some suggestions. Thank you. Could I jump I, I'd like to jump in here with a question that I had pertaining to reasonable uh, accommodation. Uh, Professor Tanda, do you think reasonable accommodation, the mechanism of reasonable accommodation guarantees substantive ends or is it a process? It gives us a way to make transparent the things that we take into account while arriving at a decision. So this, this exercise of whether something is reasonable or not, it invites us to 
engage in a transparent process of reasoning but does it guarantee us a substantive end or a substantive outcome uh, uh, be, be, because what 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 could we do in cases where there is a practical constraint uh, uh, my way of understanding reasonable accommodation is that it's it's more concerned with the transparency of the reasoning rather than a substantive end uh, uh, and, and and so how how w w what are your well subtly the way uh, see if you look at the formulation of reasonable accommodation the formulation of reasonable accommodation uh, is like the very fact that you have to assess whether the accommodation you're seeking is disproportionate or not whether what you're asking from the other is something which is like reasonable or it's like way beyond anybody's means. The very fact that you're, you've defined reasonable accommodation in that manner uh, necessarily means that it's not, a, it's not guaranteeing a substantive uh, outcome for you. It's not guaranteeing it. There are times at which some people would get it. There are other times where others won't get it. And I'm sort of, that's why saying that the formulation of, you know, the, the fact that you've brought in the whole notion of proportionality within the definition of reasonable accommodation and the formulation reasonable and accommodation. Accommodation is always about adjusting and saying, okay, as much as we can, we will adjust you. And at the same time, you are saying denial of reasonable accommodation is discrimination and it's equivalent to your denying your, your right to equality not actually being honored. My issue somewhere is this, that how do we want to put the emphasis? See, the American with Disabilities Act, which was as such the way more powerful statute, if you look at the text of the statute than say the Act of 95, our Act of 95, the, the entire jurisprudence of reasonable accommodation destroyed whatever they had gotten because the American courts were so intent on trying to see whether what you're asking for is proportionate or disproportionate, right? The other way, and as, as you're a law person, you know the other way in which this whole thing could have also been interpreted and that interpretation was open and possible was to be saying that, okay, uh, the purpose of bringing this this particular definition or this particular principle into the law was inclusion. The purpose was inclusion. So we have to interpret the whole business of proportionality for obtaining inclusion. You know, within, if we can be obtaining inclusion with like a, you know, big ticket kind of an uh, change which has to come in, or maybe with a smaller thing, which may require the person with disability also to somewhere adjust. But the outcome of inclusion is not to be compromised. You would be, in, you would be creating a totally different jurisprudence of reasonable accommodation. The, the argument I have tried to raise today is primarily just this, that let that objective of inclusion and let that, that be the guiding factor in how you're both formulating the law and implementing it. If you see that as the non-negotiable, then you come up with a very different. Otherwise, it's true. The text allows for all the interpretations which have come. And if we are saying that the literal rule is the primary rule and we are going to only look at the text and we are not really worried about that, this interpretation is resulting in what kind of outcome? I, I am only putting forth this that if you brought in the principle of reasonable accommodation as a part as a part of equality to the students, and if it is not resulting in equality and inclusion, but exclusion and ouster, then that is fundamentally problematic. It's fundamentally problematic. And the only way in which it can be critiqued is through the kind of uh, theorizing the sort of narratives, the sort of experiences which you find in disability uh, studies uh, uh, literature, not in law. Right, right. So it's important to ask the question as to what is reasonable accommodation for? For, for here you see, very typically in, in uh, 
statutory interpretation, we have these two choices, no, always. We never look at, we look at the plain rule, but we also look at the mischief rule. We say, what is the objective? And judges and courts, when they really want to help, then they set aside the text and they start looking at the objective. I am saying is that, that objective jurisprudence is much more what we require. And for us to make that case for objective, uh, you know, develop the reasoning, which might kind of at least find some, some, I'm not even actually looking at quotes. I'm, I'm saying to get purchase, get purchase even within discourse. Because you go to court and you do other things subsequently, but firstly, in our own minds, we should be convinced that this is the way to go. And I'm somewhere drawing upon disability studies work more for creating that discourse. And I'm saying that from that discourse, then, you know, like possibly some suitable litigation legislation may also come. It may come because law is a rigid discipline and we feel we are the, we know everything. We don't have to learn anything from anybody. So just the fact of like, you know, giving a rap on the wrists of law people and say, ha, you know, as judges, you're meant to be fair to people. You're meant to ensure justice. Are you doing that? Is that how you are, you know, you want to do these symbolic gestures. I mean, all the tears that Justice Chandrachud has been shedding everywhere. It's important to be asking, ki, the core jurisprudence mein kya farak la hai? Uh, there's a, there's a, I'll, I'll... There's an interesting question in the chat by Hema Sain, and she asks, how can a person with disability be both knowledge creator and at the receiving end of the laws? And Shivani is asking, can there be a liminal space between law and justice with reference to disability studies? What are the ways to address the gap in juridical political battles for people with disabilities. So law and justice, that's one question. And the second question pertaining to uh, the, 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 the role that disabled persons can play. How with can they the be in a dual role people. situation? Yeah. But they are in a dual role situation. That's, that's a fact. And the, the difficulty somewhere, uh, Hima, you said? The first yeah. Question. yeah. The difficulty somewhere, Hima, that comes in is this that you know it's it's like if there are these barriers that I'm confronted with, then the barriers I am supposed to surmount those barriers, as well as I'm supposed to be creating these other alternative routes. So both these both these things are meant to be put on my head. And which is inherently problematic. But the only thing that I suppose disability studies has some way done is that it's moved the person with disability from that total uh, identity of victimhood towards being an you know, agent with, with knowledge and power and experience. So it's like somewhere a countervailing thing. When you, I mean, I know that, that uh, nothing about us without us has been a, like much oft quoted, but one of the core things of that principle is basically this, to tell the non-disabled world, Tumko kuch aata hai. it's about time you start listening. And I can tell you this much that, uh, and, and that is something that you have to be doing, but your, because your experience in some way gets you to be able to leverage that realm of knowledge, one can't deny either. I'm not saying everybody will have to be doing it, but those who can be doing it or those who want to be doing it should be doing it. I, I mean, I, somebody who says, I just want to be a human living like everybody else, just because I have an impairment, I have to take out a janda. I don't think it's fair. I mean, the rest of us also just live our lives. All of us are not going there and doing political activism, irrespective of how unhappy we may be with situations. But at the same time, there are some of us who do it. I think for people with disabilities, the very fact that these two roles are being acknowledged is a move forward. Before that, you only thought of persons with disabilities as recipients of other people's knowledge and as victims. 
you didn't see them as empowered beings, as knowledge producers. We made a big move forward that this is happening because that's how the rest of the world is also. Everybody is not an activist and everybody is not out there to change the world. Most of us want to say, I want to do my job, I want to do my job, I want to you know, like the, the ordinary life that I just want that, I don't want anything more. If there are people with disabilities who are saying the same, why not? But there are also people in the non-disabled world who say, this is not an acceptable way. This world is not acceptable to me and I'm going to stick my neck out. I am saying is the very fact that people with disabilities are as much in that place to say, I am going to change this world and this is not acceptable to me, is a move forward. Uh, I somewhere that's Shivani, what I was trying to do largely was to say that uh, the presence of a law or like even you had judges very like openly saying it at forums that we are courts of law, not courts of justice. And I think it's the role of the rest of us to tell them that if your law or your decision is going to affect the life of so many people, then you jolly well be closing the space between law and justice. And if you don't, it is the job of the rest of us to keep saying, ha ha. I, I really, really do think a large amount of legal writing is much, much too plauditory of the institutions or of people you know, wielding the kind of power. I think it's about time that they start getting nice choice galis. They have to be sophisticated galis because we don't want to get locked up into Tihar and wherever else they send you. But, but the necessity, and especially it has to necessarily come from civil society, from academic forums, because the, the lawyers and the people who are more intimately connected with the judicial system, their bread and butter, you know, like is much too dependent on what happens. Uh, whereas for the rest, it's still possible, the possibilities of dissent are higher. I'm not, see, I'm not even saying, I'm, uh, I'm not saying Shivani, it is easy. I'm not saying so at all. But I am saying is that the very fact that it is difficult is not a reason for saying it can't be done or that it shouldn't be done. And also I make, I mean, as an academician myself, maybe with, I would say with activist orientations, but I'm not a really a field person activist. And I do think that there is a very intimate connection between thinking and doing. And it's that intimate connection that workshops like these and conversations like that are promoting that the person who's going to go out there in the field should have a very sound idea of and this is how it can be done. And I would really recommend that you look at the, the bill which was made by the committee, not because it was some perfect thing, it had its own share of compromises, but it was definitely a much more imaginative venture. And more importantly, it came from within the sector. It came with, high level of consultation, huge amount of participation. I mean, I don't know of any other legislation in the country which got translated into every language of the union and was brought out in sign language and braille and what have you, at least an effort was made. More importantly, the processing of the suggestions was also done where you started putting out, okay, okay how are you going to change what, where? And interestingly, if you were to do that comparison, you're going to find that in the legislation which ultimately got formulated, their backup is at each point of time that will. You're going to find whole segments which they've just taken from there. The reason why I'm also saying is that, you know, in terms of strategy, because I don't think this is the last battle or the first one that you're going to, the government was reacting to the civil society's legislation. Civil society was not responding to the government's legislation. And it makes a difference in what the final thing has come. Just look at the Mental Health Care uh, Act and look at the Disabilities Act. Just set up a comparison between them. They had two and a half consultations on the Mental Health Care Bill. It was primarily drafted by two technocrats. They had these two consultations, one in Delhi and one in Bangalore. 
right from the first uh, draft which came out till the final thing got passed, not a single thing got changed in terms of perspective. Because I mean, even I will say very honestly with you that I was, as somebody who was involved in the making of that bill, one was very disappointed with what came. But I suppose now I, by some chance, I had to sit and read both of them again for something I was writing. And I realized that it wasn't as much of a defeat as one thought it was. Because you constantly keep finding that the fact that the government was reacting to the civil society draft put the government on the back foot. They couldn't go, you know, they couldn't sort of, they tried one round and there was so much hue and cry that they had to sort of like, you know, make, make a hasty retreat. It's important for the sector to see like, okay, what you could win for when you really fought for it sort of things. And I'm seriously saying, please set up these two, two legislations and look at it, is okay. Uh, what I'm not, See, uh, in lawmaking, uh, all of us will tell you that it's it's a it's a work in progress, you know, and it's a, it's meant to be so. But this space between law and justice, and to push the law towards justice, is an all the time venture. All of us have to keep being keep at it. Uh, in fact. This distinction that uh, judges tend to make that courts are courts of law and not courts of justice, it doesn't seem to be, it just doesn't seem like a sound one because law creates spaces for judges to do justice. This entire area where, of, of discretion, uh, this entire area of determining the best interest of the parties, this entire area of uh, of, of reasonable accommodation as well, what is relevant and what is not, what is so, so these are so at every step of the legal process, judges exercise discretion. Judges Ooh, exercise. But do they acknowledge choice. it? <laughs> they don't exactly. They don't. Uh, so, so I think we have to begin by demolishing that distinction. Absolutely. And and, Absolutely. and, and sort of sort of uh, pointing out that judges play a greater role. I mean, uh, they they have wider powers than they than they claim to have. Um, they hide behind the law, no, Satrishi. They hide behind the law. They will say that, oh, we don't make law. Uh, we, we, they constantly say, we don't make law. Uh, Shanti Sira is saying what? Uh, she's saying, shall I expect feedback? Uh, there is a long question by Sanskriti Sanghi. Uh, Sanskriti, do you want to... Um, Unmute and ask the question to Professor Dhanda because it's a it's a long detailed one. I'm afraid if I had to paraphrase it, I might lose some parts of it. Um, sure. Thanks, Professor Mandel. Um, thank you for the talk, Professor Dhanda. So my, I had two questions that I've put down in the chat box. My first question um, came from the uh, April judgment that the Madras High Court has delivered on the issue of terming persons with disabilities as divyang. And in certain paragraphs of the judgment, the court seems to suggest that a legal challenge to a terminology that translates into divine persons is, um, is, is taking an issue to the point of absurdity because it is not rude or humiliating. Um, and so my question was, what would you say is the role of language in sort of embedding perceptions about disability within the law? And what can judges be made to undertake or what can they be made to do to understand that by, you know, by reiterating this very language, they're amplifying or intensifying the othering nature of language. So what can they be made to do to reform their practice? So that was the first question. Um, and I can go on to say the second one or wait, whatever you prefer. Well, I can quickly answer this one and say that I suppose amongst the things which is good for us in relation to judges is that at least their reasoning comes out in black and white. And they are to that extent open, uh, whether they like it or not, it's not like they like it, but at least they are subject to criticism. And that criticism is what you can offer. You have to be saying that, listen, man, you got it all wrong. 
and it's like more uh, there's a whole school of thought in uh, in law where we speak in terms of you know that the biases and prejudices of judges very often inform the sort of decisions and the kind of reasoning that they employ so then it becomes like you lift the veil and you demonstrate that this is the bias and prejudice which has been demonstrated so that would be what i would suggest and do it in all kinds of forums it's not like you know immediately that particular articulation maybe we can't change but if there's large scale criticism of something it forces the person to look at it and that's the job which i'm sort of some way bemoaning that we don't do enough of it in in academic writing we do it but we don't do enough of it much much more we are saying this is what the court said wah 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 you know that sort of things if not wah wah it's like still uh, the very fact that uh, of uh, some people might even sort of feel that because the court said it it's become like a final word and the way in which all good legal thinking happens is that nothing is neither the legislation nor the adjudication the adjudication is subject to one the particular articulation it is subject to its criticism and you can always be going back in another case and saying this is what this chappy did and it's all wrong and why if you have generated enough amount of critique because they are sensitive to that extent that i don't say that if they are personally criticized or some if something is really hauled up that nothing at all affects them that's not true so that's that is the importance of language in perpetuating stereotypes i totally agree with you the necessity for why is it important but it's also true that whether you call something divyang or you say person with disability or you take the entire people first language but you don't do anything else then the people first language also becomes as good or bad as the the pejorative language so the two have to go together thank and you and i can only sort of offer that you know large large scale writing to say oh you shouldn't feel offended i mean this is who the hell are you to say so thank you professor that was really insightful my second question is shorter so i'll uh, hopefully get it done with sooner and then others can come in so my second question comes from the experience of teaching over the last one year and i teach jurisprudence um and so my question was if law is viewed primarily by students especially the way that most legal subjects quote and quote are taught as an epistemological pursuit where they have to find an authoritative source and like you also said it's a top down body of knowledge where there's singularity and superiority um and disability studies is a body that perhaps is more ontological and foregrounds experience even if not singularly then how would it be possible to bring together these two methods of inquiry in a harmonious fashion particularly in pedagogy um because especially if we see the law school as the space that prepares prospective lawyers how is it possible to integrate these two um and introduce students to them both not as stand alone compelling arguments but as ones that can be brought together thank you okay uh i i used to teach a course called legal methods and it's taught in our first semester you know when students just come in and i insisted on calling that course legal methods in the plural and not legal method and i used to have my vice chancellor come to my course every time and saying but look what is it you know why should you be calling it methods now my point somewhere is this and this is something i said i kept saying this is the dominant way of seeing the law but i'm not saying this is the only way of seeing it there's a whole body of you know critical literature of looking at law and i insist on teaching it theoretically in the first semester because i want my students to know okay this is not the only way in which you look at law and there is a necessity of under you know whether it is in terms of realism or critical race or critical disability studies or you know you bring in the whole range of other perspectives simultaneously and give them situations and say okay if you look at it as a positivist coming in a top down way how are you going to look at it very dissatisfying results very unhappy but then the moment you start bringing in other theoretical lenses and show that both reasoning and consequences at least as the possibility of change you've given people an instrument by which to think that's how i have done all my pedagogy all my life 
And I have been like, you know, my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues would say that this is too early to show to shower that kind of intense theory on students. I would say nonsense. They, it's like they can, you know, you don't have to make it a complicated venture you know, of uh, using big, big words. But the core idea, if you get across, people comprehend. And I've had any number of people saying that when they were really, really unhappy with the legislation or the decisions coming in from it, from court or judge, they suddenly remembered there were other theoretical options. And that's very, very emancipatory, liberating for the student. And I think that is the instrument all of us have to provide wherever you get the chance. Because I was teaching a course in jurisprudence and theory, I could do it. And I insisted on doing it in the first semester and kind of saw to it that they comprehended it. We looked at a whole range of problem situations, made them interpret it through different lenses for them to comprehend that if your lens itself is faulty, naturally you see it all wrong. But if you see, if you think this is the only lens through which I can see it, you will never want to correct it either. All right. Uh, so we have four minutes left. I can see Santosh Kumar's hand is up. Santosh, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, hi, hi, Professor Nanda. Uh, thank you. I send you an uh, email. You, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's, I, I have been uh, in awe to receive your mail uh, on the conversation that we had uh, in the last uh, 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 panel discussion that <laughs> you were mentioning about. Uh, and I, I, I tried twice to reply you, but I could not uh, muster courage and refocus uh, 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 what I should write. So uh, the, the reason I, I raise hand is the first one is that I should uh, I'm, I'm here to thank you. Uh, and that's, that's give me a sense of, uh, 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 sense of purpose for any question. And because that day when I asked the question, I, I thought it's, it's a too obvious question to ask. But uh, the way you have reflected on the question that day and uh, again the further deliberation on it, uh, is really, I mean, uh, I put out a hunt for you, Santosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got it uh, from your mail, uh, and I'm, I'm really uh, uh, thankful to you for uh, the, the, the generosity with which you have replied uh, to the mail, uh, to the to the query that I made. Um, today, I uh, today I, I have this. Uh, I just just go back to the question of uh, legitimacy of the disability studies to or other discipline uh, and how it can uh, inform other discipline and all. And the uh, the question of language. Uh, now, my my question is uh, to how far we can go uh, to to use the expertise of disability studies discourse. Or, uh, or the knowledge about uh, disability, uh, disability that we have. So, I mean, uh, Samir and uh, Sharmista, we all have been thinking about the metaphorical use of disability word or uh, the words disability. So the way we critique the government or sometimes the state, yes, uh, uh, or uh, this is uh, 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 the, the use of this one. And uh, uh, Tosky uh, talks about this, how uh, it, it can use, these, these terms can be used uh, uh, from the perspective of praxis, social praxis, and that will also legitimize uh, this knowledge that we have about disability. But my problem is that when we use these uh, uh, terms in a metaphorical sense to criticize or critique the government or the state or others, Right. Uh, we somehow also reinforces the very uh, negative connotations associated with it. Right. So how to uh, reconcile it? Uh, uh, this 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 dilemma uh, to to use it or not use it. Uh, uh, and I'm I'm not sure whether it has any legal dimension over here. But I I do see you as a person uh, with not only legal expertise but also lots of uh, a reflection on on the things. So if you can just comment on it, it's okay. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's as always. I was just, I mean, Santosh, I mean, I don't even know whether I'm answering you on all fours, but it's just like an idea, a thought which came to me as I was listening to you. 
that one of the things which was at least done in a very major way by feminists in when they were trying to work out that very often, even when they got positive outcomes from the courts or from official uh, agencies, the reasoning which came in was very offensive. You know, the, the, the bhasha in which it came in was offensive. You, you didn't much care, you know, you, it's like, I think um, Ratna Kapoor in her subversive sites actually speaks about this fact of that whilst what they, what the, how the court decided the matter was satisfactory, the reasoning they employed to, to reach where they reached was not satisfactory. So amongst the things which was done, and I think even if we look at, excuse me, the Sucheta Srivastav case, uh, wherein though the choice of this woman with intellectual disability was respected by the court, but the kind of reasoning which came in from the Supreme Court was far from satisfactory. You know, it's like, it <laughs> is, you sat there and you looked at the MTP Act and you said, no, 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 mental retardation has not been this thing, so hence she can do it. So what about, you know, a woman with mental illness? It's like that you are, even as you are so-called you know, taking an emancipatory line for one set of, uh, and you are using mental retardation. They have they have actually reproduced the entire declaration for mentally retarded persons in the judgment. Not even recognizing that the entire bhasha has changed, and they've got two sentences exactly on the CRPD. And India has also signed the CRPD, so we should also be respecting it. It is obvious that you've not even opened it because you could not have, see, they are judges. They know that between a convention and a declaration, the convention is the binding law, not declaration. Declaration is soft law in international terms. And yet they reproduce the entire declaration and gave these two lines for the convention. The only thing I can think of, and this is just for you to, I mean, of course, it, it could be a project which comes in with law people and linguists and others and all, but it's like they did this whole judgment rewriting project where you go back and you look at the same thing and you sort of develop a reasoning which is more in accord with both in terms of language and in terms of reasoning is a more empowering one. Is, is, is creating the kind of discourse in the bhasha we want it to be discussed. Because let's, let's accept it, you know, if we don't do it, nobody does it. It's, it's unfair, I agree, but it's, that's where I suppose uh, the kind of solidarity which comes between scholarship and activism, the kind of uh, combination which comes in there is worth pursuing. But I think a judgment rewriting project would be a very good place. Similarly, you know, to like look at everything which comes from the government is to start saying, could be one way of handling this because if you are, I am actually, okay, maybe I'll just answer you in one sentence, Santosh. I would say it is worthwhile to produce materials rather than to react to the nonsense that they send out to us. Yeah, thank you, Professor Danda. And I do agree with your comment on uh, Justice Chandra's to which I feel that he's masking uh, the disability cause. Uh, he is using the disability cause to mask his other adventures. Absolutely. And he's, he's milking it to kind of in some way get himself a human face. And I think it is the responsibility mm -hmm. of the disability sector not to allow him to do that. Just one more thing, uh, uh, ma'am. Uh, could we get some read, reading reference to the talk that you have presented today? I mean, is there any paper that you have written which we can refer to? I have done one for, uh, you know, Shirish Deshpande, which is uh, which is like still just, just been submitted for their publication. They are saying it will come in December, but I don't think I have any difficulty of sharing it with you, Santosh. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. That would be helpful. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm writing, uh, I'm replying to you. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> um, and, Professor Danda, Pro Professor oh. Danda, just a small comment, query, or whatever form you want to take it. Uh, like, just 
this is not cheap like when i approached lawyers for this case the delhi based lawyers you do whom i know from these rights based solidarities which we have told me that samir uh, i will be available for you filing a case in uttar pradesh and then others i approached in lucknow i got to know that okay uh, give me full fees of to 1 lakh to 5 lakh <laughs> and i will fight fight your case and then like they are also making it a business a professionalization law like it is not my area it is my area it is out of my comfort zone it is within my comfort zone so uh, as uh, as the pre uh, as someone asked you earlier like the very representation which uh, was submitted on behalf of me to the commissioner of disability uttar pradesh like from delhi i asked a lawyer who knows something about disability law she drafted a wonderful a good draft of my representation but uh, in lucknow uh, where i happened to no few yeah. lawyers they, they they said no no ye nahi chalega isme thoda sa aise likhni hogi the person is aggrieved and usme person with disability bhi aa raha tha usme uh, differently abled bhi tha so yes like that the way it is then like it is currently happening to me like so i am i am also reflecting ki kya hai ye so yeah i have a student sort of practicing in lucknow samir i can at least if he if he becomes some some kind of a fulcrum for help it might be worthwhile not that this is a solution to the structural question that you're putting forth but all of us have to manage with sometimes symptomatic solutions and sometimes you know like to work for structural solutions so i will check out with him and come back to you because you are on that group so i can reach out to you so yeah all right uh we've come to the end of the session and quite reluctantly we'll have to uh <laughs> end the session there are a lot of questions i'm sure but we have no choice but to end it i just want to in conclusion i wanted to uh sort of draw some connection between what professor dhanda said today and uh, the comment by santosh kumar about language and metaphor so one uh, uh phrase which is uh, used a lot in uh, in law is uh, that of uh, standing so this uh, action does is does, does not have legs to stand on or this argument does not have legs to stand on and i recently sort of uh, googled the prevalence of it and i found some 23000 hits uh, so it's it's that familiar that such and such argument does not have a leg to stand on and as a metaphor what it suggests is that uh, a legitimate action or a lawful action is something that that has two legs to stand on uh, right so, <laughs> very so, so ableist right. yeah. very ableist absolutely <laughs> ableist and this is something which uh, uh, lawyers use judges use i even have this judgment a uh, 2006 madras high court judgment uh, 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 which was a which was a, a, a judgment that upholds disability rights it gives a favorable interpretation to the pwd act and in conclusion even this disability friendly judgment uses this phrase of standing <laughs> and uh, this thing so uh, and and this somehow connects to what uh, professor danda said that lawyers and and law as a discipline has this uh, has this uh, belief that we know everything humko sab kuch pata hai and we are always standing erect we have two legs to stand on and maybe as uh, our task as uh, uh, as as uh, disability scholars and activists and academics is to uh, is to sh show the other side of the law that law does not know and law is not always standing erect on two legs or 
you know law is probably lying down law is probably not able to stand and there is a uh, i mean so then that becomes the, the the project for us as to how to show laws vulnerability and and uh, <laughs> you know saprishi we used to keep saying you know that ignorance of the law is no excuse so i also say ignorance in the law is also no <laughs> excuse yeah you know it's it's the same of what you're saying it's like to, to yeah. sort of like expose the kind of ignorance in the law where they actually right. believe they have answers to questions they don't even know the questions properly yeah all right so unless tuti has some concluding comments i'll uh think yeah i just want to thank you dr dhanda for such a wonderful session you've really given us a lot to think about it's been absolutely Thing. It was such a delight to listen to you and learn so much. And thank you, Dr. Mandal, for moderating with such incredible insight and dexterity. And I especially want to thank the interpreters, Gargi and Suti, as well as the audience for engaging in the discussion and asking meaningful and incisive questions and adding to the conversation very meaningfully. Tomorrow we meet at two p.m. for our session on the Marrakesh Treaty, and then again at four p.m. and six p.m. Thank you all for joining, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. Okay, bye bye.